on. Um, so we, we still have basically the same type of activity that we were seeing yesterday. So fish are able to continue to maintain fountains that, that have reached 200 to 250 feet in height. That's actually the highest recorded fountain so far of this eruption, is up to 250 feet. There are uh, two smaller fountains adjacent to the, uh, the main, the primary fountain, and those are reaching heights of up to about 60 feet at a sustained level. There's also a cone, tender cone growing on the downwind side of the primary left event, which are eight. Um, and by, uh, so the fissure 8 flow is still moving, um, it's still very wide, and it's moving down still uh, along Highway 132 in, into the area of the Noni Farms Road. But the flow front has advanced uh, more slowly than it did yesterday. It's only going about 50 yards per hour. Um, earlier this morning, about 6 a.m., there was a, a breakout of the primary channel that sent the flow down Wakamai Street to the north, and that's in the long of the state subdivision. And that flow has almost reached Cobalt Easy Road, and uh, the, the projected path is, is just further to the north um, down to along the decline of descent. Um, there's also chili pear and other volcanic glass that are being washed away from the major eight mountain, but that seems to now be flowing um, not into the Leilani Estates area. Uh, the winds have changed since yesterday. Uh, there's also uh, figure 18, uh, was only about a half a mile from Highway 137. However, the, that, that figure seems to have been have slowed down. Uh, today and it hasn't advanced very much. We do have drone crews measuring the advance rate and, and the floor front, mostly for the one that is being fed off of Fissure 8. And low level scattering is continuing from Fissure 21 and that's just continuing to flow down slope towards the ocean entry, probably reoccupying the channel that was developed there. Um, the summit is, is still erupting. The deformation rate is deflating pretty quickly and um, sorry, quickly relative. It's, it's still kind of maintaining this, the same type of deformation signal, um, and earthquakes are still occurring at the summit, although seismic is slightly lower over the past 24 hours than it was um, the day before when seismic city rates were very high. And there continues to be some minor ash explosion from the summit, but are just seeing downwind. And we are also uh, in trying to work with our partners to get a notification service, a type of notification service put together that will help people downwind of the ash plumes to be notified if there is a significant ash event. Uh, but that has not completely been figured out yet. We're just trying to figure out what the parameters are to constrain that type of notification. That's all for me. Thank you, Wendy. Our next speaker is Jessica Farrakane. That's S as in Frank, E-R-R-A-C-A-N-E. Jessica Farrakane is a public affairs officer with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Good morning. I have three updates to share with you all this morning. Uh, first of all, the uh, work on Chain of Craters Kalapana Road as an evacuation route continues. Yesterday, the bulldozers were able to um, move through 1,600 feet of hardened lava, which is about half of what they need to go through. So there's a good chance that that route will be um, possibly complete by this weekend. As a reminder, this is an evacuation route only, a one way out, not a regular ongoing thoroughfare. If there are any media on the phone who would like to see video and or photography and the news release that went out yesterday, uh, please contact me and I'll be happy to share that. Uh, the second update is more of a rumor control. Uh, there's apparently some rumor going around that people at the park have been laid off. I wanted to make it very clear um, there have been no layoffs as far as National Park Service staff goes. We have 134 people working in uh, for Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and I can, I'm happy to share with media who are interested uh, where some of us are working remotely, et cetera. I won't go into that laundry list here, but um, if you would like to know more, I'm, I'm happy to share it um, after this call. And I said there was one more thing I had to show. Oh, yes. Uh, the temporary flight restriction um, is, has been extended to uh, August 31st. So there is still a TFR above the summit uh, to 30,000 feet above ground level, extending out a five nautical mile radius. That's all I have. Thank you, Jessica. Our third speaker today is Garrett Rowe. 
Derek is D E R E K. Road, W R O E. Derek Rowe is with the National Weather Service, which is part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Thank you, Derek. Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just touch on the, the trade winds. They, they strengthened yesterday. We had a little disruption on Tuesday, and that caused uh, some of the instances of the reports of tennis hair moving off in a different direction. But the winds did firm up yesterday, and it got quite breezy by the end of the day. And there's very little change today. So we have northeasterly trade winds around that foot area in 10 to 15 miles per hour. Uh, the transport winds, which are just above the surface, are quite strong as well, pushing everything off to the southwest. And we don't anticipate much in the way of change in the next 24 hours. So we're expecting to see similar conditions through the day today and tomorrow. Maybe the winds a little bit weaker. Uh, the trade winds themselves, they're going to be about 15,000 feet deep. So most of the eruptions we've seen at that, the actual crater have been around 10,000 feet or less, so the trades do in fact go up to about 15,000 feet and move off to the southwest. So any emissions that come out of it will move off to the southwest. Uh, tomorrow, the trades weaken a little bit. They'll be a little bit shallower, maybe as low as 12,000 feet, but still still fairly deep. And then uh, as you move in, you could have a little bit of slightly weaker wind by Saturday, but picking up again. So not, not a whole lot of change, just slight variations in the wind over the next couple of days. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go into our question and answer session, I want to ask reporters to um, please ask one question at a time so that we can get everybody in. I also want to remind people that we will try to cut off this phone call, or, or should I should say we're going to try to end this phone call at um, the half hour mark, 2.30 in California, 11.30 in Hawaii. So uh, don't wait to say I have a question and raise your hand. However, I do want to point out there's a couple of new videos that the U.S. Geological Survey Hawaiian Volcano Observatory released today, and there are links in the media advisory that was sent to all of you today, just about 10 or 15 minutes before this call started. There is our usual daily update of the daily briefing. Um, there is also a link to a video that was shot with one of our scientists working 24-7 in shifts monitoring the lava flow and some new video footage released from one of our monitoring drones at the summit of Kilauea. So do check those out. Um, and then, uh, Karen, I think we're ready for our first question today. Thank you. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star, then one, and record your first name along with your affiliation. Our first question comes from Miguel of CNN, so your line is open. Hi there. Uh, good to know you're still here, Wendy. I hope you were uh, taking off. Uh, question for you is, we had a 5-4 earthquake uh, yesterday. There has been a lot of earthquake activity. What can you tell about what's happening uh, at the crater, at the summit, uh, and the magma below? Is there new magma entering the system from, from deep down? Hi, Miguel. Um, yes, I, I am still here today. This is Wendy. I, I will not be on the call tomorrow because I am I'm flying back tomorrow. So, we actually... We aren't really sure what is going on with the plumbing system right now. Uh, there's still quite a lot of magma beneath the summit. Uh, preliminary calculations, and this is back of the envelope calculations, as it were, um, are indicating that only about 2% of the magma that was in the summit storage region uh, could have left the summit storage region. So there's plenty of magma there, but even the decrease in volume by that much is calling the subsidence that we're seeing. So the, the down dropping and the um, deflation at the summit. So that's still continuing. It's, uh, we are still registering that. I don't know exactly how many feet uh, the summit has actually deflated. With the last count that I had, I've said on this call, was five feet. Um, I, can, I can get some new numbers and, and maybe I can relay those to people uh, who are going to do the call tomorrow. So, so the thing that we don't really know is is where there's definitely magma coming into the system. It's kind of a continuous, you know, we, we say that it's a continuous supply coming from the core mantle boundary, so very deep inside the Earth. It's a hot spot volcano, and there's always this um, lost in plume. We call it a plume. It's a different type of plume, obviously, of um, hot molten mantle material that's rising up into the volcano of Julia itself. And there's, so the summit storage regions are still there, but we obviously have a, a more, um, we had magma moved down from Pu'u'u'u in some area. 
can't remember if I said on the call yesterday, but we, we definitely have the cool oral composition of magma erupting at the surface. We've been saying for a while that it, it was mixed with older stored magma, but we don't see that happening anymore. This is this is composition that's exactly akin to cool oral. Uh, that's, that's all I have for you right now. Sorry. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve of Reuters. So your line is open. Yeah, hi. Um, you said yesterday that the, um, that the temperature of the, of the lava that was uh, erupting now on the fissures uh, was as hot as it's been and about as hot as it could be expected to get. Uh, and uh, somebody asked, well, how hot is that? And you were going to try to see if you can get, this, get that number. And, uh, so I was wondering if, it's like, if that's still the case today and, and, and if, you know, if you can tell us, like, it was a temperature or a range that we could support when we say it's the hottest. Hi, sorry. Um, just so you guys know, I'm on my cell phone, so you might hear people talking in the background um, from where I'm standing. But the, the temperatures that we're measuring on the fountain height, or the fountains themselves, which is what we are able to measure now, is about nine, 900 degrees. And uh, the, the thing with measuring fountains is that you... That's 900 degrees centigrade. Sorry. <laughs> and I can't calculate. I can't do the conversion right now, but hopefully somebody can do that for me. Um, the, as we're measuring the fountains, it's hard to get into the center, which is, which is the hottest portion of the fountain. We can, you know, point a thermal infrared camera at the fountain, get a, um, temperature reading, but there's these cooler bits of the fountain, like the class, as it, as the molten material is jetted upwards into the sky, it breaks apart, and just like you would spray a garden hose up into the sky, and, and the pieces break apart and fall down. But as these pieces are falling down, they are cooling. So we're often registering kind of a mixed temperature signal that it's from that the cooling outer margin of the fountain with the interior uh, kind of mixed in. And those temperatures are, are around 900 degrees centigrade. And Wendy, I can inject that 900 degrees centigrade is equivalent to 1,652 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jim of Westwood One News. So your line is open. Hi, good morning. Wendy, if you could answer this, uh, actually I don't know. We're a month into this now, and is there anything in the current event, maybe the lava being as hot as it can possibly get, or whatever else may be out there, is there anything that gives any indication as to the future of this thing? When it when it might start winding down, or is there anything we can tell from the current conditions? Hi, um, this is Wendy from all USGS. So, right now we don't see any changes occurring. Um, I, I just mentioned yesterday on a call that this deformation signals that we're seeing in the lower east drift zone anyway are have stopped widening so there was a widening across the rift zone itself which was something that we interpreted to be an injection of magma that, is, that was pushing the rift zone out of it and this, that's not um, happening anymore so but that doesn't mean that there isn't plenty of eruptable magma beneath the surface uh, again you know we've we been trying to Look in this with eruptions that we are familiar with in 1960 and 1955 eruptions, and that was, you know, one lasted just over a month, and the other one lasted three months. And it's hard to say right now. There, there's no sign that we're getting that anything is going to slow down at the moment. Thank you. Once again, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star, then one, and record your name and your affiliation. Our next question comes from Kevin of Honolulu Star Advertiser. So your line is open. Thank you, Wendy. Sorry to make you repeat yourself. I dialed up about a minute late. Um, you, when you were uh, describing the fountaining from Fisher 8, and I believe you said that it was the highest that had been recorded yet. Could you just repeat that sentence, please? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, those, those height measurements were likely made overnight yesterday. Um, I was at, in Pahala at a, a community meeting uh, to deal with the ash that they've been, the ash and the bog increase that they've been experiencing in that community. And when we were driving down from um, the summit area, we could see the fountain on the horizon. And then 
driving down 130, coming back into the Pawa area, we could see the fountain again. And it was the first time that, that I had seen that fountain on the road. So those measurements that were made overnight were about 250 feet high. Thank you. Our next question comes from Miguel of CNN, so you let us know a bit. Hi there, sorry. Uh, just a quick follow-up on the 2%. When you said 2% of the magma in the, uh, the crater on Kilauea has made its way into the system. I, what, or how, do, how does one put that? What does that mean? And, and does it act like a, a plunger or pressure on new magma that entering the system? And that's why we're seeing this sort of extreme fountaining? Um, actually, that's, that's not really why we're, the, the fountaining is, is occurring the way it is now. Um, typically, in these in, in these eruptions, the, the fountains themselves start to get higher, and especially now that we're seeing a cool oil composition, it's because of the the magma itself. It's not necessarily the pressure behind it. Certainly, the pressure is causing the magma to be forced more upward to the surface. But as the magma is forced from behind. Uh, it decompresses, the magma itself decompresses, and there's gas that comes out of solution, and the bubbles form, and then that provides additional pressure, and it's that gas release and the pushing of the gas itself that is propelling the fountains higher, and the, the magma that is that was from Pool in the summit area just has more gas in it. It, was, it wasn't um, sitting in the rift zone for a long period of time where it could evolve and grow crystals and outgas. So that's that's really why these fountains are higher. It's because of the amount of gas that is in the magma itself. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lynn of Hawaii News Now. Maybe line is open. Aloha Wendy, um, just trying to get an idea on the amount of acreage that the flow has covered so far. It's been a couple of days since we got that update. Do you have um, updated numbers? Um, so, the, I don't have a new acreage number. I, I can find that out later today and make sure that we get a many update out. And then I was just apologizing for not putting a many update out. Like I said yesterday, that I was looking for the fountain temperature. We didn't actually get a temperature until earlier today. So, um, I will make sure and look that up. I will talk to the people that are doing maps for us and, and try to get a correct number of acreage and have that as many update onto our website. Thank you. As a reminder, please press start and one if you'd like to ask a question. Our next question comes from Steve of Reuters. So your line is now open. Hi, I, I want to ask one other question. In, in terms of like just duration, so we're, we're now at the full week mark, and so just overall activity, you know, in terms of lava flows and fountaining and, and uh, eruption from the summit crater and ash and everything, it, 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 is it possible to say this would be this is the, the biggest or most energetic eruption cycle or long duration since when? Since like 1960 or 1965 or, or somewhere sometime more recent than that? Um, so. Uh, I guess that's kind of hard to say. I mean, the cool oil eruption itself was continuous for nearly 35 years, and so that's pretty long duration. There have been uh, eruptions that have occurred in the past that have lasted longer than that. Um, the Isla Al eruption that, that built its way that's close to where there's some lava tube is now, um, that lasted for 50 years. So there, there are very long duration eruptions of Hawaiian volcanoes. It's, it's what they do. They, they create these... Um, they just erupt for a longer period of time. Uh, there's a continuous supply of magma coming up from from the mantle, and so it just lines its way out in, a, in just a more continuous way. Uh, these just zone eruptions, the ones that occur lower down, this is a lot of area, um, a lot of distance for them to travel from the summit down to lower east of zone. So in that process of travel, more things can happen all along the way, and you know. There could be an earthquake that blocks the path, and and then the eruption looks up. Or, you know, only a certain percentage of er eruptible magma is in the rift zone at a place where it can get up to the surface. So there's, there's just lots of variables the further you get away from the actual source. Does that answer your question? Let's put it this way: is, is this part, is this considered part of the same eruption cycle that began in 1980, or is this sort of a, a separate event from that eruption? Cycle? That's a great question. Um, 
we we have been talking about that, and we're pretty we're, we're pretty much ready to call this a new eruption. Um, who OO doesn't show any sign of activity in it at all. Um, there's still a little bit of deflation happening at Pool OO, but there's no intended flow. There's it, it just doesn't seem like um, magma will return to that area. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna you know I can't really call it official. Um, because I'm not the scientist in charge, but you know we've, we've been discussing that about what does this mean? Is this just a new eruption, and, and are we, we're going to have to call it something new? Thank you. Our next question comes from Caleb of the Associated Press. Say your line is open. Thank you. Hey, Wendy, this is for you, and it's uh, apologies if I haven't uh, heard this before. I was out in the field a lot, but. For Holly Mau Crater, when was when was that crater created? And can you describe a little bit for me what that eruption was like? I mean, was this hundreds of thousands of years ago, or when when did that go off, and what was it like? Hi, great question. <laughs> um, I don't know the exact date. There's there's um, there's some good information on our website, but I, the caldera of Kilauea was formed in. Uh, 15, in the 1500s. So there was a, um, a period of 300 years that were very explosive, much more explosive than what we're seeing now from the summit of Kilauea. And, and that, over that period of 300 years, the caldera itself formed. And um, Colin Mount Mal was first uh, observed and documented to be at an active lava lake in 1823. So we do know that there was a, a lot of lake there in 1823, but the, um, the crater itself was much smaller than it is today. And uh, when the, the lava lake drained away in 1924, um, it was a smaller crater than, than it is today. And after the 1924 eruption, Holly Mountain Mount itself grew in size. And we're seeing that now. Holly Mount Mount itself has grown in size. I'm not exactly sure if the amount of collapse of Holly Mount Mount, but the overlook vent, which is where that host is lava lake, within the Holly Mount Mount has nearly doubled in size, which is essentially taking up the whole eastern half of the crater. And, and we have a radar image on our website that shows that. Our next question comes from Alicia from BrutalizerRadio.com. And your line is no open. Hi, I would just like to go back to how you guys are considering that this is going to be a new eruption. Um, what are you doing to monitor some of the low temperature volcanic gases that we haven't really been hearing about, but that could have some health effects on people? Are you, um, which types of volcanic gases are you talking about? Some of the more low temperature ones, you know, the ancient helium, methane, you know, some of those gases. How Are you guys currently monitoring those and, and are you going to use that? for your information since considering you're going to call this a new eruption. Well, um, I didn't say specifically that we're going to call it a new eruption. Um, we are in discussion about that. And those, those gases are not ones that are uh, the primary concern for monitoring the volcano. Um, I think that the health issues would, would need to be discussed with the Department of Health. Uh, they do have monitoring networks around the island, and they you know, there's, there's lots of sensors out there. If you go to the Department of Health website, they have, you know, there's information about fog. They, they do things to map fog. Uh, and that, those, you know, I think the Department of Health has a good handle on the, the hazards associated with volcanic gases, especially in Kauai. So they really are the best ones to answer this question. I can talk about what we're doing for monitoring volcanic gases here. Um, we had a team that is out. They're, they're on the ground. They're using... Um, Sensors that are that are measured, they're measured by hand. They also have drones that they're using to measure um, materials in the plumes that are coming off um, from the summit uh, and and off of the lower eastern activity. And, and the primary ones we're measuring there are uh, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so we're doing hydrogen sulfide calculations based on the amount of sulfur dioxide. Carbon dioxide can be a, um, an equivalent measurement, but of course that's not toxic to human beings. Uh, so. You know, we, we are doing, we, we do have a handle on the primary volcanic gases. So hopefully you can follow up with the Department of Health. Uh, there's a good website that's called the Broad Information Dashboard. And on that website, there are contacts and other resources from agencies that deal with monitoring air quality. Um, 
So please, that would be a good place to go to find out more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you describe for me a little bit about the interconnectivity of the uh, various volcanoes around Hawaii? You know, I know that it's a, it's a hot spot for volcanic activity, um, but does, does, does this activity on, Mount, um, on uh, Kilauea have any impact or relationship to uh, Mount Aloha or Loihi Seamount or any of the others in the, in the region? Um, is there any indications that there could be activity anywhere else in, in the state? Hi, I'm Lisa Wall, USGS. So uh, we are continually monitoring all of the other volcanoes in the state, and you can go to our website and find data from the monitoring instruments that we have out on on the volcanoes. Uh, Loihi is a special one because we can't really put monitoring on the seafloor down there with the volcanoes, so we use instruments that are located on land to measure whether there's been any mostly earthquake activity down in uh, around Boehi, there has not been any, and there, you know, Mauna Loa is still quiet. There's no sign that there's any activity returning to Mauna Loa, or Mauna Kea, or Hualalai, for, for that matter. Um, everything is, everything is quiet except for the activity that's going on in Kilauea. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question comes from Tom of Hawaii Tribune Herald. So your line is now open. Hi, uh, yes, yeah, there's some debate still about whether this is counting as an eruption. Is that why it hasn't been named yet? I can't actually answer that question. Um, I think there's just so many moving parts, and people have been really trying to deal with the response, ensuring that we're getting the correct information to Hawaii County Civil Defense. And and really, this is you know it's been an all hands on deck effort from the entire USGS Volcano Hazards Program. So I don't know that there's been time to sit down and think about that yet. Um, you know, the people's lives that are being impacted are those are our primary concerns, and naming an eruption is focus of the session at this moment in time. Of course, thank you. Main Volcano Observatory reports that vigorous lava eruptions continue from the lower East Rift Zone fissure system in the area of Leilani Estates and Lani Puna Gardens. Due to the active volcanic eruptions, Mayor Kim has issued a mandatory evacuation order for Leilani Estates. The following policies are in effect. Starting at 12.06 p.m. today, the mandatory evacuation order is in effect for all civilians in Leilani Estates, including and east of Pomai Kai Street. Everyone will have 24 hours from the effective date and time to evacuate the mandatory evacuation area. Persons remaining in the mandatory evacuation area beyond the effective date and time of this order do so at their own risk with the knowledge that emergency responders may not respond. Persons in violation of this order are subject to arrest and will be liable for any costs associated with rescue operations in the mandatory evacuation area. Refusing to evacuate may put you, your family, and first responders in danger. Heed warnings from civil defense officials and stay alert. We are on watch 24 hours a day for your safety. Thank you for listening. This is your Hawaii County Civil Defense Agency. Okay, um, that was a drone footage that was recorded during the, the rapid outbreak of lava that occurred in Leilani Estate um, that went down Luana Street and, and took out the 10 um, lots in 10 minutes. And there was a resident that was uh, that was that was trapped by lava, um, basically between. I can't. I don't know the exact story, but it was between certainly between lava and I, I believe a dense forest. And we had a drone crew being flown by the USGS while this was underway, and the drone crew was in the area, and, and the drone crew was able to find out where this person was that was trapped and lead people to rescue him. So when, what you're seeing is kind of people running through the. Um, you know, flashlights of, of people trying to get this person rescued, and, and they were rescued. Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reports that lava from several fissures continues to move through Leilani Estates, Lanipura Gardens, and towards the Kapoho area. Hawaii Fire Department reports that a fast-moving flow in the area of Noni Farms Road is heading toward the Wawa area. Residents of Government Beach Road, Kapoho Beach Lots, and Vacation Land are at risk for isolation or lava inundation should a flow reach that area and are advised to evacuate due to the possibility. 
Due to the volcanic activity, the following policies are in effect. Evacuation area residents including Leilani Estates, Government Beach Road, Kabul Beach Lots, and Vacation Land with approved credentials are allowed to enter from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. This curfew is strictly enforced for your safety. Placards to re-enter these areas are available at the Disaster Information Center at the Pahoa Community Center Monday through Friday 9 to 3. Highway 132 is closed. Residents close to any volcanic activity should remain alert and be prepared to voluntarily evacuate if necessary. Stay tuned to local radio stations for updates from Civil Defense. We are on watch 24 hours a day for your safety. Thank you for listening. This is your Hawaii County Civil Defense Agency. Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reports that vigorous lava eruptions continue in Leilani Estates and Lanipuna Gardens. Breaches in the channel formed by the Fisher 8 flow can happen without notice and result in rapid moving flows. Everyone is advised to stay away from active volcanic areas. Due to the volcanic activity in the Kapoho area, the following policies are in effect. Hawaii Fire Department has evacuated residents and homes along Papaya Farms Road and Noni Farms Road. Any residents remaining should evacuate now. For Kapoho, Vacation Land, and Government Beach Road, the following policy is in effect. All residents of Vacation Land and Kapoho Beach Lots are advised to evacuate and complete their evacuation. The possibility of being isolated. Due to the active volcanic eruptions, Mayor Kim has issued a mandatory evacuation order for part of Leilani Estates. The following policies are in effect. Mandatory evacuation is for areas east of Pomaikai Street in Leilani Estates. Residents have until 12 noon tomorrow to evacuate the mandatory evacuation area. Persons remaining in the mandatory evacuation area do so at their own risk with the knowledge that emergency responders may not be able to respond. For your safety, heed warnings from civil defense officials and stay alert. We are on watch 24 hours a day for your safety. This is your Hawaii County Civil Defense Agency.